exciting. So Jeff, tell us what life is on like the other side of the curve. You guys are heading downward, right? Yeah, knock on wood. Um, yeah, knock on wood, exactly. Uh, I, I ventured out yes, uh, last Friday for the first time. I had to go to campus. And Korean society is up and running. Stores are open. Traffic is existing. Um, um, we never had the mandatory lockdown, but people just kind of stayed home. So you're and, good rule followers to begin with. Yeah, and mask wearers. I really think that is a difference maker. Um, again, not necessarily to to uh, protect yourself. Defensive but... is a prophylactic for the per. You know, I was on a subway, yeah. and yeah. I would say I, I saw no one who didn't have a mask out in society. Maybe ninety eight percent of people were masked up on the street in the subway. Everybody, and I was glad. Yeah, I think the last time Tom and I took public transportation, it wasn't not this Wednesday, actually like two Wednesdays ago. We we're on the bus. And it was just like, this is silly. Like <laughs> we're just all packed in here and it, you know, people are coughing anyway, cause it's, it was still winter and people had colds and stuff. And so you're like, mm. so then well, we just kind of- That airport and... scene in Chicago was, was yeah. horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, the, uh, the post is up and running. The stream is up and running. <gasps> Oh, wow. This is exciting. So I looked at it. That is like circa 19. No, not 19. <laughs> when did we start? When did you put that with the Drupal together? 2002 or something like that? Oh, Drupal, man. Drupal and I are like in an abusive relationship at this point. How did you even know to log on? Like how you said to log in? Uh, I have maintained various logins because I have kind of Kept an eye on things, made sure they're still functional. He you also still pays there. bills, Jen. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> how many web? Uh, you, how many URLs do you still maintain? Uh, URLs. I mean, actually, functioning sites. Uh, I'd say a dozen are still up. Mean um, domains. Domains. I have, like I'm down to almost nothing, like a hundred. <laughs> Can you start selling? You should be able to like retire on your. I have sold some. As I say, you can't even buy anything today that actually may, is a word. So I sold uh, artbridge.com and I sold sportsbridge.com. There you go. And each of them paid the domain bills for a year or so. Oh, there you go. That's pretty good. Yeah. We're missing our fourth. Where's our fourth? So Jeff, you're teaching like your, your schools and everything are. Well, I feel like I should, we should save some of this for the show, but yes, I am. Oh, I've been, oh I'm sorry. Okay, I've yeah, been zooming be since uh, March 2nd. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Continuous. Don't, don't tell me any more details. No more exciting details. Um, have we ever used chat roll before? Is that like an old one that's now called chat roll or something? Uh, it's a uh, chat wing. We, we have used Chatwing in our latter years. Mm -hmm. So is it any better on YouTube to try to facilitate a chat? Has that improved over the years from a live stream? Um, uh, you know, usually when I see it, I'm watching some sporting event or political event and there's just, you know, crap. lots of crap flowing through. Yeah, okay. So that hasn't really changed then. <laughs> It's really not. But Jeff, with one click of a button, people can now, what, what was your, you're saying? You thought that in how many years people would have their own radio <laughs> show or whatever. World of global webcasting. It only took 20 years longer than you predicted. There's Dave. How you doing, Dave? He's okay. muted. You're muted. One of my favorite features of uh, Zoom is the mute all button. <laughs> <laughs> is he still muted? He is not muted. I don't hear him. I do not hear him. This is how I spend half my life now showing my students a picture of <laughs> audio settings. Find your audio settings. <laughs> I'm confident Dave can figure it out, though. I know that will be funny if he can, because that will. Kind of take me back a few years. So I was looking at 
the last webcast we did, it was two weeks before I was diagnosed with breast cancer. So that was kind of a flash from the, from the past. I was like, wow, where did those five and a half years go? That was September, 2014. Yeah. Yeah. yeah September, like September 14th of 2014. And then I um, was diagnosed in October. Wow. So How's insane. everything on that front? Good. I mean, I still have my annual scare. Like this year I had a pretty big scare and had to have a biopsy. It was fine, but there's just a lot going on after you have radiation and surgeries and stuff. So they, if they see anything that freaks them out, they just freak me out for a couple of weeks and you go through the whole biopsy, wait for calls, cry when you get the good news you know, or converse. They have to go cry back for more. Exactly. Exactly. So it's kind of like the new, the new normal, but I did hit, and again, I'm, hit, I'm knocking on a lot of wood tonight, but I did hit the five-year mark. And so there's some chart out there that says that's better than, than not. So five years is better than four years. Four years is, yeah, is exactly. Years. I'm just wondering, Dave, do you hear us? But you can't speak. Oh, how about now? <laughs> yay, yay, we hear you, Dave. So much for being done in five minutes. <laughs> it's really interesting. I've never seen No, we no. lost you. Doesn't like my headphones. Hmm, we can hear you that way. Unless you get a weird echoey stuff. What happened to your big uh, big boy mic? Yeah. It's in the other room. Are we all going? I think we're all going to the other room with them. Going to the office. I have so many questions, but Jeff said we can't ask questions until we start. I didn't say you can't. I no. said you know, I'm now. saving some of my thunder. <laughs> That's right. We don't have all that much to. We've all been stuck inside for days. What do we have to talk about? Okay. Yeah, we can Yay. hear you. Okay. Oh, wow. Echo? It's DJ Dave. Any echo? No. I mean, I hear your chair rattling, but now I, now I don't. Okay, now? Perfect. No, uh, you're going to say perfect. I'm actually asking Jeff. He's, gonna, <laughs> he's the one who's going to be whining about it. Hey, <laughs> it sounds lovely. Oh, uh, that's lovely. And can I tell you how often in the last few weeks I have wanted to say to major broadcast networks, can you please step up the audio? Like, I understand oh. Skype. I'm cool with that. But like, they accept subpar audio. For, I don't know why. It's not they, that hard. Yeah, anybody will talk to them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this microphone costs 150 bucks. Some of those shows are done by people who make $100 million a year. <laughs> Like buy yourself a goddamn microphone. Like, seriously. <laughs> I think Please I have that one. I think, can I hold that on? Is that, I, that's what I think I gave my friend to use. I don't I'm going to go load up on coffee right before showtime. Be back. Okay. Jeff, can... Good thing I have pants on. Well, yeah. pants-ish. <laughs> pants-ish. <laughs> can we rearrange the, the order in uh, gallery view? Oh, is that something you can do? I think Dave's yellow is the same as my yellow. It looks like you're in the same room. Are you guys in the same room? Yeah. Are you guys not social distancing? No, we're six feet apart. <laughs> we always social distancing, even when we're, next, when we're together. <laughs> together. We never actually sit near each other. Dave, look where, look at, look at behind me. Look behind me. This is a fake background, but it's soon to be my log cabin. I'm just bringing you up to speed. Maybe. <laughs> Jen, could you bring up the weather map? I know. <laughs> and here we have. See, everything is backwards. So when you do it, it's kind of funny. That'd be awesome mm -hmm. if you could bring up a weather map. We just watched Groundhog Day for the first time in like 20 years and it's early on the weather mapping stuff uh-huh so it's a huge gigantic joke that there's a green screen uh-huh it's like watch i'm really set up i got the kids wound up to got to watch you got mail uh-huh just uh -huh. so they can watch an entire yeah. movie premised on the idea that there's email email and you get excited when you hear the ding <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah it's like when i made the kids watch the 60s era swiss family robinson and they're like that tiger totally doesn't belong there it's in the wrong continent 
Of didn't you have i just think i saw you what did you have us mm -hmm. try of yours it was like the oh the dvd the dv camera yeah yeah oh that was amazing he just sat there and giggled the whole time he's like you guys had these <laughs> they had these oh the oscars uh discovery of old tech that was hysterical yeah yeah no i uh it was awesome too because he kept going, like watching him trying to find the thing he just recorded and he goes well where is it i'm like well it's backwards on the tape <laughs> Back so oh like it's a physical tape inside <laughs> yeah yeah no it's a physical tape inside you've literally got to rewind it how did you guys even do this? It's so like rewinding. Like, how do you edit? Yeah, like rewinding really meant something. It wasn't just like find, you know, have it go find that spot digital. I mean, it was like, no, you had to sit there and wait for it to like get there and you went too far and then you go back. Yeah. This, that whole thing is baffling to me though. He doesn't doesn't hadn't he had experience with cassettes? He owns a cassette player and buys cassettes. Right. He, he just never, never thought about the check. This is the song again. Never thought about it. Yeah. Wow. Oh, so he does. He like he has tapes. He literally buys cassette tapes at the at the oh, uh, at the uh, music store. Oh, so Actually, the thing that freaked him out the most though was all the noise it made. Oh yeah, click, 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 click. <laughs> it was that stuff that freaked him out. He's like, "What's it doing?" <laughs> now I understand R two D two, right? So he when we first started, he was like born. He was born, but he was like. A year, right? Posey was yeah. not not born. I remember. No, that. no. I when Jeff and I age. first first started, Oscar wasn't born. Wow. Yeah, I remember listening to the episode of you of right after he was born. Wow. That that was an early tech talk. We've hey, got Jose. Ed Ted Joe. Is that it's Jose? Oh, yay! Hooray. Uh Speaking of starting, shall we get started? Sure. Who's doing the intro? I'm going to do it. Yay. It's What's the order? What's the order? Uh, Our hellos in an order? We're going to wing it, see what happens. I know we had an order. Didn't we always have an order? It was like Jeff. I mean, it was Dave, me. It was me, Dave, Jen, Jeff. And then John. All right. Go on. I'm going to go first. You guys okay. see what happens. Okay. Hello, and welcome to EdTech Talk 86 being streamed live on Equinox Weekend, March 22nd and 23rd, 2020. This is Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea, joined by... Dave Cormier in Windsor, Ontario. Oh, <laughs> this is Jennifer Madrill in Chicago, Illinois, slash some log cabin in Wisconsin. And this is John Schinker in Stowe, Ohio. Hi, everybody. It has... Hey, it has been five and a half years since we last gathered for a webcast. Nine and a half years since EdTech Talk 85. So uh, what's new? <laughs> what's new? <laughs> I was going to say, what was the decision point? Wait, you made this an EdTech Talk versus an EdTech Weekly. I... You're saying you never released all of those other ones that we've been, we've been talking about <laughs> for the last five and a half years. Really yes. We're uh, re doing the audio, cleaning up the audio. Uh, I don't know. I thought I just couldn't call it EdTech Weekly with a straight face since it's been five and a half years. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> uh yeah but i you know i um we've all been going through crazy times and certainly the ed tech world has played uh, a role in all the change in society and i thought well who who do i want to talk about it with and i thought my old ed tech weekly buds so here we are i thought maybe we could start off uh, since it has been a minute since we've gathered if we kind of update where we are what we're doing and uh, how this whole thing has affected our day jobs and lives Sure. Let's go in order, Dave. You what is the order? Are we all in the same order? Like I don't even know. This well, is now I'm the top. I'm going back to our old time. You always started off, didn't you, on the link round? Yeah, well, yeah. you can't ever get me to shut up. So obviously, because no. <laughs> <laughs> like, can I talk now? It's my turn. It's my turn to talk. I don't know. Can you make? Can you adjust the where we are on the thing? I don't think you can. Can you, the gallery? Uh, I'm happy to start though. Um, <clears throat> I've moved to another province in Canada. I'm now in Windsor, Ontario. If you look at the descending part of Canada as it wanders down towards Detroit, we are just south of Detroit, if that gives people any sense of where that is. Um, and I have just started two and a half months ago as uh, doing digital learning strategy, which two and a half months ago, everybody was like, what are you gonna do? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> we know and how now, to do that, right? Well, who needs that? Uh, and then suddenly, um, as those of us who are been involved in online learning have discovered, suddenly people want to talk to us um, and have questions, and they want those questions answered right now. So that's pretty much been my life now. Strangely, for me at least. Um, this thing has now come and everybody's in a hurry and everybody wants to talk to somebody who knows online learning, but I don't know the answers because most of what they want to know is how do I set up an MCQ exam or like, how do I do the thing in Blackboard that does the thing with the thing? I mean, it's just not, I haven't spent any time in a learning management system. In about want to talk years. about rhizomes? Want to talk about rhizomes? <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about theory? Uh, no, no, no. I just, I want to put my multiple choice exam on the internet and I want to make sure my students don't cheat which I always respond, that's impossible. Just forget it. Just let them cheat. And then their yeah, eyes get wide. Where, and, where know, we are now, right? we've, we've been talking about this so long. We've moved to what is learning and how does learning look and not tools, but all of our stakeholders are, are missing that conversation. They're at the, how do I do exactly what I was doing last week, but from home now? And it's all been, our whole first week has been focused on how do we get the tools in their hands and, and get those simplified and get them, you know, training on here's Google Classroom and here's Zoom meetings and here's how you can record a video and send it out to your kids and here's how you can, you know, give them something to do that's meaningful and not just, you know, workbook pages that nobody's ever going to look at. So, you know, can you update us on what where where you are, what you're doing, and how it played out for you? Yeah, the last I, few weeks. I'm, uh, uh, Technology administrator, technology director for a school district outside of Cleveland. Um, it's the same job I've been in for 21 years. So I'm still doing the same thing I was doing last time we talked, which is kind of overseeing all aspects of, of technology. And since we last talked, we, you know, bought devices for every kid and, um, you know, went to one-to-one. -one. We, we spent uh, several years talking about what instruction looks like in uh, this century and how uh, how we need to adapt and that happened in some places and it didn't happen in other places and now we're learning a lot about what's actually going on in our schools as we uh, hear from our teachers who are kind of panicking about you know what what does the new world look like but um, mostly I've kind of the last couple years have been more on the operational side like getting the infrastructure to work making sure devices are deployed and, and working make sure that you know, the internet works and we've got enough bandwidth and firewalls and like all of that stuff. So I've been less hands-on on the instructional side. Um, we are fortunate to have some instructional coaches in our school district who do a great job of working with teachers and, and taking them from an instructional perspective and through an instructional lens and then bringing the technology to that. And they're, they're super good at that. So I work with those folks quite a bit, but don't spend a lot of time hands-on with teachers anymore. Do you miss that? Um, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are pluses and minuses to both sides. You know, I, I get frustrated on the tech side and, and it's really nice that I can walk down the hall and talk to the coaches about learning for a while. And then, you know, when I get frustrated there, uh, we need to buy more document cameras so that we can do, you know, workbook pages on a smart board. Then I can walk down the hall and say, let's, let's work on some, you know, some computer stuff for a while. So it's, you know, it's good to actually have a balance of both. Yeah. All right, should I go? Sure. Okay. So I think the, the last time we had our EdTech Weekly, it was September of 2014, and I had just put in filings for a nonprofit called Designers for Learning, and they were approved in uh, 15. So I spent from 2014 to actually February of this year um, managing a nonprofit called Designers for Learning, and we did all kinds of fun things where we had instructional design students take on uh, service learning projects to create instructional resources and learning experiences for mainly nonprofits that are in the adult education space. And I noticed I, I ended it, I bookended it in February. Um, for a lot of reasons, we spent much of last year deciding what we wanted to be going forward and we came to a decision that we didn't wanna be anything going forward. Um, Things had really changed in the space we were working in, although now things have changed dramatically and maybe we wouldn't have made the same decision. But when we first started out 2014 timeframe, students were having a hard time gaining experience. And so they were very willing to do service learning, meaning free work for people. Um, but over as the economy got better and people got jobs, we were utilized less and less. And not to say we didn't have a lot of great people participating with us, 
um, but we did some great projects, but we were finding it really hard to get funding also as well. So when we got through the process last year, we were kind of coming up with like a fee for service model, which was pushing us more to like an LLC versus a nonprofit. And so we decided, well, if we're going to do that type of work and if we're going to do fee for service work, we'll just do it as consultants and just do it individually. And so we've parked the nonprofit right now. Um, however, as I said, in the course of the last 30 days, I think my students probably could have done a lot of good service learning for people um, if we kind of kept things chugging on. So who knows, maybe that will change. And then kind of tying back to my question to you, John, the work I'm doing now is I'm helping subject matter, I, I'm working as a subject matter, helping on a grant funded project for adult basic educators to integrate technology in that context, which reminds me a lot of K-12, probably 20 years ago, where they don't have technology even at their disposal. Some don't even have Wi-Fi in, um, in places that they're teaching. Um, and I adore it. So I'm working with a right now a cohort of adult educators who have a ton of uh, experience as educators, but not a ton of experience integrating technology. So they're literally purchasing Chrome books as part of this grant, and they're going out finding out what OER is, Open Educational Resources. So a lot of the stuff we've talked about for 15 years here, um, I'm getting a chance to like bring it to a new context. That's so cool. That book ends my five years. As an aside, I love my Chromebook. When I was in the States, I bought a Chromebook. My goodness, what great value. And like, it, I, it's kind of replaced my iPad for my commuting uh, productivity device. I'm using device. one right now. And it's the only device that any teacher in my district has seen me use for the last year. Like every meeting I'm in, every time I have a device, it's a Chromebook. And, you know, we, we, we look back at things like OLPC and, you know, this $100 laptop idea. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> let's take devices to Africa and just drop them off with all the kids and, and, and all of the, the baggage that goes along with that. But, but one thing that did come out of that whole mess is we've got affordable technology. We've got yeah. the ability to hand things to every kid. Change the price point. worry about it so much. Yeah. So that world has changed a lot in the last seven or eight years. Not that anybody asked, but I'll tell you about me. Oh, uh, I asked. Oh, <laughs> I guess you on. said the newly shaven Jeff Lebo. Yeah, you know, because of uh, all the masks we've been wearing, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I found that they're irritating my beard a little bit. So I thought I'd give it a shot without a beard. Uh, uh, Korean school year starts March 2nd. I got back from the States February 18th. Uh, the hot spot happened like February 21st. So shortly after that, we got the call, and I should say I'm teaching at the Pusan University of Foreign Studies. I teach uh, undergrad and graduate courses, Puffs. It used to be Puffs, now it's Buffs. Uh, oh, right. And, and I also coordinate um, a teacher training program where teachers take public school, experienced public school teachers take six months off, and they study with us for five months and then go overseas to Canada, Mississauga, was the plan. Um, so... February 20 something, the word comes down, okay, university's postponed for a couple of weeks, teacher training goes forward. Hey, could you do something online? <laughs> so I, mean, I don't know, what is this online? <laughs> so I rediscover Zoom, what a lovely, lovely, lovely. program. Uh, and in all, for full disclosure, I am now a shareholder. Uh, <laughs> so, so part owner of Zoom. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sold. Um, so starting March 2nd, we've been having nine to five every day, all day, Zoom That's sessions with time. these teacher trainees <laughs> and dealing with the exhaustion of that for them and, and learning the importance of balancing synchronous and asynchronous. Sure. Um, and then March um, 20th, the online learning, or March 16th, the online learning kicks in for the undergrads. And for me, the biggest challenge, like, you know, I'm used to including some ed tech in my classes, a blended course, you could say, but I prefer the uh, Wild West uh, lack of order approach, whereas now we have to use Canvas. And we have to, according to the Ministry of Education, have this many, 25 minutes of video content for every hour and oh this many. Yikes. And so dealing with the bureaucratic stuff and just kind of learning Canvas. I am the one who, who wants to know how to copy a quiz from one subsection of a course to another <laughs> subset, like all of that. So it's been 
challenging um, and very thought provoking. Um, yeah, so that's where I'm at. No, it's funny you say so that many because questions, so many questions. You know, it's funny you say that because the same experience that I had because I've been trying to figure out what I should be doing, right? Because suddenly I'm in the midst of this online revolution and I'm feeling a little useless, frankly, because I can't answer your quiz question. So here we are with Jeff and I, who, you know, first met. Jeff taught me how to use a discussion forum, what, 20 years ago? Yeah. Um, and now neither of us know how to use a technology <laughs> that people are trying to figure out. But I mean, for me, what I've, what I've focused in on is assessment because it seems to be the keystone of all of this. And that's what I'm doing in the background is trying to pull together enough people to put together an argument that we need to change what we think assessments for if we're going to do it on the internet because oh my god are you approaching this from a big term approach or a get through the semester approach no i figure um as i'm not totally practically frontline for this term i'm thinking fall because I'm, I'm basically making the assumption we're not going back for fall um and if i'm wrong then but if i'm right the, the worry that I have is that all the people who are doing the fantastic work at the front line now are going to get called before the provost on the 15th of April when they're exhausted. And they'd be like, I don't care anymore. Uh, it's just whatever. <laughs> and so what I'm trying to do is put into place some things that say, look, an MCQ in a distributed way online, if you're doing it for real grades, is a waste of time. There's no way to stop the cheating. There's no way to, I, I, I don't call it learning anyway, but even if you did, it's not going to work on the internet. You can lock down a browser, but I mean, you can record people's faces, but you know, if I do this all the time, does it mean I'm cheating? Um, so some real, real problems I think we've got coming up and that's the stuff I'm trying to get involved in right now. So anyway, John cut me off earlier. I never got a chance to say it. Damn John. You know, I'm also figuring out how to, you know, my undergraduate courses are conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but in a way this tech, you know, Zoom is great. I love breakout rooms. I love uh, that I have a, a recording of, of class. You know, it's an adjustment for them. They spend usually the first 10 minutes of class just making sure their hair is okay. <laughs> you know, appearance is a big issue. <laughs> and like, there's always sort of that awkward, you know, first week of school social component, which is now online, which I think some people are very comfortable with, some people aren't. You know, for the teacher training, uh, one of the courses I teach is uh, technology integrated language learning. And this is great. It's really much better than leaning over their laptop. Uh, you know, you, I can annotate, I can say, well, they have a problem. Can you share your screen? And I can annotate. I, I love it. The other is teaching workshop where they're doing teaching demonstrations and micro teaching. And that is difficult to replicate what a face-to-face -face class would be. So figure out like which some course content is just well suited to this some is just not so so many questions so, <laughs> so you were saying your course was face to face and now you're switching it like midstream plus then you're planning for stuff that hasn't started right jeff uh our program is was is a face-to-face -face program normally it never got started it never got started so they didn't know each other before correct okay so we had so week they're... one in zoom okay got um, it and you had how much time to like design your course? One week. One week, yeah. So how did, how did so, everybody figure out how old the other person was? <laughs> In Korea, that's kind of essential to- Oh, that's essential to- The know. grammar of addressing uh, someone. You literally can't finish a sentence unless you know how old the other person is. Because uh, the ending is changes based on the other person's age and status. Uh, like, how do you even solve that problem, Jeff? Well, like, teachers you generally right? use sort of the respectful well, grammar to toward each other oh, anyway. Right. Sure. <laughs> so you got to just, just teaching English doesn't matter. <laughs> just teaching English doesn't matter. Oh, right. Okay. Jeff is teaching English. <laughs> That's true. English is a much more liberating language in that sense. Um, so uh, lessons learned so far, tips and tricks. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of, I was going with some, going somewhere with what I was asking you. So oh. because I've been, when I, when this first all kind of came down, it's been kind of interesting to watch Twitter. So like, Everyone's like, oh my gosh, I need to design an entire course in, you know, three to five business days and maybe I'll get the weekend. And so people are like, you know, actually trying to do that. Well, you, you can't do that. You can't create, like you're saying, you needed what, 25 minutes of video for each week plus, you know, it, you know, you can't. There's just not enough hours in the day. 
and then it's gone to more of like the triage, like mash unit. <laughs> We're just going to get done what we can get done. And I think it's going to be kind of interesting to watch how that has panned out. And then also kind of emotionally, people are like, not only am I supposed to do this, but my kids are now home because schools are closed. I can't exactly know where I'm going to go get my groceries. Um, I'm worried about my parents that live in another state. And so like, there's just convergence of, of issues. And you've become a counselor too, because everybody, half the people who come in are like, what am I supposed to do about my research? Like you, you've done this. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, I haven't done then, anything. Plus then the post that like, literally it started out as a joke, but then people are like, well, with all this new free time you're going to have, why don't you get those papers written that have been sitting off to the side <laughs> of the desk, you know? Um, so I think that part's just kind of this, the, the watching that trajectory has been really interesting. And that's why I asked you, like, were you doing this midstream or like, or is this a whole new cohort or whatever that you've got of students? Because I think, and yeah, kind of I, what you said, to, um, um, Dave, too, as far as like what you're planning, you like, it's totally different thinking about the fall versus what you're doing next week. So totally. Yeah. I would say my early lessons learned are. A, don't assume your students know how to adjust audio settings. <laughs> just because just they're young, they don't. <laughs> and two, cut yourself some slack. Like it is going to be challenging. You know, I, I have a little bit of experience in this area and it's, a little. it's been so much more time consuming for me. And to try to do teaching in a meaningful way and jump yeah. through all the hoops and learn the stuff, yeah. cut yourself some slack. Jose makes an excellent point in the uh, chat room. What about like special needs students? Sure. Or, yeah. you know, right. Young right. learners, how do you get online with them. Although I should mention uh, today in Korea, EBS, which is like the big education broadcasting uh, setup here, is starting live teaching for elementary, middle, mm. and high school. Yeah. So instead of just saying, okay, go. <laughs> I've heard a lot of parents say, screen time limits are gone. <laughs> They're gone the first day. <laughs> but now you can plunk them down in front of the TV and they can actually have a day of school or not on TV, it's uh, all streamed. Yeah. yeah. We had, um... We had planned to have a single day with just staff in before we closed the schools and ended up canceling that and telling everybody to stay home. Um, so our teachers uh, found out Thursday night that Tuesday they were starting online instruction and Monday was a day to plan for that. And Friday well, would, would be their last day with kids. So we were fortunate to have kids in. You know, my, my biggest fear in planning for this was we would decide at 7 p.m. to close school starting tomorrow and the kids wouldn't have anything home with them, right? Because we right. were sending Chromebooks home and textbooks and whatever. So uh, they had one day to prepare and we realized one day to prepare isn't anything really when, when you haven't done this at all. And um, so we really focused the first week on social emotional needs and just caring about kids and helping them through this really disruptive change, right? Because kids are, especially at the elementary level, are so driven by routine and this is what we do and is so unsettling to them that what do you mean I'm not going to school today and I'm not going to school this week and when am I going to see my teacher and what about this person's birthday party and who's going to you know to, to feed the bunny in the classroom and um, you know but but we had this thing planned with this you know they're, they're worried about everything and so just trying to deal with that first we said you know what don't worry so much about teaching them anything just try to get them um, get them into a basic routine for online or for at home learning and really focus on caring for kids and part of that was you know record a video so that or even an audio file and send it out to your kids so that they can see you talking they can hear you talking um, you know share your voices with them and let them share their voices with you and so just connecting with kids, I think, was was really important the first week. Now we're getting into second week, so it's you know it's shifting a little bit. Um, there's still a lot of that, still a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety. But it, now we're starting to okay, can we actually get some you know some academic stuff starting to happen? And that kind of gave us our teachers a little bit of a runway too, so that they could spend some time thinking about how am I doing this online. So did you have a, the, were the students and their parents at all familiar? Did you have like Schoology or did you have like anything that they yeah, we're were used Google to? Classroom. Um, we're, well, we're using Google Classroom in grades three through 12. And they had used that before this transition? Like they had logins and everything? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. The kids okay. have been, and, and ironically, our elementary kids, our third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade kids, no problem. Teachers, no issues. <laughs> they use it all the time. Really where we had like the biggest concern was at the high school level. Um, mm -hmm. 
because they're very tend to be very traditional in their instructional methods or a lot of our teachers are and so you know that was and dave had mentioned a couple times i think on one of his uh one of his i don't know what those are vlogs this week about you know the te the professor who wants to put his six hours of lectures online so this kids can watch it it sort of had to had to do some coaching there and have them working within their departments within their grade levels and, and trying to rethink how we're doing this in an online environment so those conversations are happening that's good but um to answer your question I, uh, we had the groundwork already laid they they have they've been using the devices they're familiar with the ecosystem um the specific tools have taken a lot of training you know using doing a video conference they hadn't done that before the kids hadn't mm -hmm. done that before um you know teachers are are doing things in different ways but but the basic tools were there you know, when I think about the lessons learned from this process to actually answer Jeff's question for once, um, the thing that has struck me the most, I mean, I, right now I'm working with faculty. So I actually have a faculty job, but I'm working with other faculty, whatever that means. Um, but they are tenured faculty who make lots of money to teach people and do research and do service. And the degree to which they feel like they lack permission to control what they do in their classrooms was astonishing to me. Not just in my own school, but in the other conversations I've had with people all over about this, where you can walk up to somebody and go, no, actually, you, you can just change what you're doing. You don't, the, the example that John's talking about, this person's assessment, he, they decided we, we changed the Senate regulations to give more flexibility on grades. And so they have permission, if they've got more than 60% of their grades done, to just not do any more assessment. Or what our real recommendation is, give an optional assessment for students who maybe want to improve their grade, but you have the option to do whatever you want. And so this guy he had enough assessment. He was comfortable with the grades student had, gave him an option. None of them wanted it, it looked like, but he still felt he had to do his last six lectures. I'm like, what's important? What do you really care about? What, what's, the, what's the change you want to make in these people? What do you care about? His social work prof, right? Like he had real things he cared about. Um, but yeah, his idea was that this is what he was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so that's what he should do. And trying to deconstruct that has been, uh, has been really interesting, you know, with passionate educators, not, not resistors, not, I don't care about the students, not, I just mail in my grades, people who cared, but still felt like there's this box of education that they fit inside of. And, and by contract, by habit, they are tenured professors who have all the freedom in the world, but don't, they, they feel like they're locked inside that tradition. That's been the biggest lesson for me in this process so far, I think. Well, I think too, like if we if all of us sort of watch the trajectory of distance and online learning and like my big, I'm such a huge fan of Athabasca and people have been pioneering stuff like this forever. Um, and the standard we've always held distance and online learning too, as far as things like you're saying assessment, well, how are you gonna assess mastery when, you know, and with all the stuff that we've already mentioned with Jeff, your students learning languages or whatever. And so I do think it's kind of interesting to use this as an opportunity to go, you know, we've been thinking about this stuff for a long time and in your face to face, like you're, like you're saying, like the very basic question you just asked, like, what do you want the students to be able to do when they walk out the door that they couldn't do or know about before they walked in the door? It's like a great place to start anyway. And then, you know, you, you don't necessarily think about it in terms of um, the content you want to cover or the format you're going to use. It's the more chapters like, in your textbook. Chapters they've got to read. And I think coming at it, and, and, and even like what you're saying, you now we have a very condensed period of trying to like get something out of the valuable out of the experience. And I think that's the best advice you can give, give anybody is to say, what would what you really hope that they'll know in these and know or be able to do? Just imagine being interesting. Imagine just doing this because it's fun. Mm -hmm. Imagine that everybody chose your course because they really wanted to take it and pretend that it's like that for three weeks and just try to do that. Well, two weeks now, three weeks when we And start. I mean, that, that's something people could do offline or online. <laughs> Imagine your on, offline course is interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, feel, that's my point. That's feel, my point as far as like the standards we hold online learning to. How many times do we have those content, those conversations when we're thinking about designing a face-to-face -face class? You know, like it, you just kind of keep doing what you've been doing. Sorry. I, I do find so much valuable coming out of this. Uh, you know, first, so many changes have been um, accelerated that 
I don't think we're, we're going to come out of this in the same place that we went into it, which is a good thing. And I have to say, as, a, as an educator, it's forcing me to rethink some things. It's, you know, it's, it's bringing a little bit of, of order to my chaos. Uh, I'd like to think I'm bringing a little bit of chaos to the order of Canvas in my own way. Um, but it's also like giving me new tools. Like I love seeing the engagement of students and Canvas gives me lots of information about that which in my assessment, Matt, like effort matters. And it's kind of, I can yeah. see, all right, Ju Yun spent five hours engaging with course material and this Min, Min Kyung spent 10 minutes. Um, uh, so I like that. And, I, and like Canvas, I'm, I'm learning to get along with it and, and, and play with it. And, you know, students care about assessment as much as anyone else. And sometimes a multiple choice tells me, did they watch the video or not? So like, I'm okay with that sometimes and bam, it's automatically graded. That's kind of okay. Um, so I'm, I'm in, when I'm not in survival mode, I'm enjoying the process. Well, how many students, that's another question too. You know, I, the, I teach also as an adjunct at University of Virginia and my classes are never over, like a big class would be like 20 students and that would really be pushing it. And so when I'm able to physically get done grading, I can do entire you know, 20 page papers, but if you've got 200 students, what you're able to use as your vehicle to assess mastery is going to be, <laughs> it's going to be different. You can't right. read that many pages. Yeah. Or, I have like 90 that, undergrad, 20 grad and 20 teacher trainees. Yeah. See that, I think that also comes into the equation as well. Like how much time do you have as the professor or to be able to um, I'm mean, going to step away very briefly to say uh, goodbye to my wife, who's actually uh, going to school today. Hi, say hi to her for give it, give hey, her a hug hi. for us. Um, but can it's you even hard. like? And this is what it comes down to: can you assess mastery at 200? Exactly. Like, I don't think you can. Yeah, I go back to like when I was sat in Madison when I was an undergrad and 450 people in a lecture hall. I mean, did the professor <laughs> I mean, know what I knew? I don't think so. No. And, and I mean, I'm comfortable enough letting people work their way through and maybe sneak their way through first and second year courses as long as there's a catch somewhere, somehow, where before they end up in some kind of responsible activity based on their degree, that somebody has assessed, I wouldn't use the word mastery, I'm not comfortable with that term, mm -hmm. um, but I think, broadly speaking, assess whether or not they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, as long as, so to me, that, that, that idea that somehow mastery is assessed in a large class at all is, is part of the problem that we've got here is that people are looking for a way to be able to do what you can do, I think, with a scan of a classroom. You can look around and go, that person has no idea what they're doing. Right, right, right. Like that, I believe that I totally believe a, an experienced person can do that. Um, are they going to be right every time? No, but no assessment's right every time. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it's, a, it's that goal that I've had that conversation you know, 20 times in the last week where I'm like, you can't do it. It's not possible. Can you tell whether or not somebody's confused when they're doing a multiple choice exam? Probably, but is there a way to design a 50 question multiple choice exam that's gonna be given online that guarantees that nobody can cheat on it? No, I don't think so. One of the things I, again, I only had 20 students at my book class I caught, taught last, uh, last summer. I used both a reflection journal, which is, we use Canvas as well. So I just had them start a Google doc and then I, um, we also then would pull similar themes back in the discussion board. And to your point, um, Dave, it was almost like that feeling when you're in, in front of people in a classroom where you can be like, you have no idea the premise of my question <laughs> as, you're, you know, as you're reflecting on this. And you can tell pretty quickly. And so to your point, I wasn't necessarily assessing mastery, but I was getting a pretty good sense of, are they even grasping basic concepts here that we're trying to cover or even making an attempt to then internalize it and you know, give me back something that made sense. You're just using it to inform your instruction. To exactly. Out, Same thing you do in a face-to-face. Summative to determine whether they have succeeded in meeting your course goals. And so there isn't really any reason for them to cheat on it because it doesn't, it doesn't affect their grades. Yeah, what John said. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, except that if it doesn't affect their grade, they're not going to do it. And, you know, you can run into that. Well, motivation through points. 
Yeah, you know what? Those points do sometimes <laughs> do as annoying as they are. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, then it becomes like then, and if they're busy. They have families. They've got jobs. Whatever. And if it's if it's not if it doesn't count, I'm not doing it. Yeah, you and get really it. what this experience is highlighting for us is that our conversation about assessment is over here, and our practice is over here, right? And so. Yeah, we, we get the whole formative versus summative and some schools are doing 80, 20 or whatever, whatever your paradigm is for how you assess learning and what we should be doing. And then here's what's actually happening in the classroom. And now we're going to try to replicate this side online. And that's where we're running into trouble. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it seems more to me that we encourage work. I would prefer if we just assessed work. I mean, Jeff said that earlier. What I'm really caring is whether or not they're working. Um, that's the part that I care about in my classrooms when I'm teaching. I just want you, I want you to try. Um, and that, that's it. And all I'm trying to do when we say we want the, to give the assessment to make sure they read the material, what we want them to do is work. You want so them if to we're just it. assessing work, why don't we just assess that and assess the quantity of work that they do. And then, like I say, have those courses later on be somewhere before people become engineers and build bridges or whatever that allow in a smaller class to sort of go, oh, you really don't get it, do you? But I mean, I've been in all kinds of conversations with police academies, with um, well, the police academy was the most striking one I've been in probably in the last, since, since we last talked, where I had three, four people from the police academy look at me and say, um, our current assessment model doesn't allow us to weed out people we know shouldn't have guns. <laughs> and there's nothing we can do about it because the person is acing through all the tests. What do we do? And I'm like, fail them? They're like, no, we can't. There's, there's no way in our assessment. We know as people who've been in, on the force for 20 or 30 or 40 years that this person should never be trusted with a gun. Everybody agrees about it. It's obvious. And there's nothing we can do about it because our assessment model is not designed to stop that person from being a police officer. Like to me, that's, that's where the real problem comes in. Anyway. This is not in this conversation about assessment. I took us down a bad road. I apologize. Well, isn't determining whether they should be a police officer or not. It's determining whether they have the training needed to become a police officer. Whether they have their memory to prove that they have I mean, one is what, what they're supposed to do. Your I've test and recall. Training. I knew all of this stuff. The other one is I need someone to actually hire me to do the job. Those are two different things. So what's in your inbox right now? What's on your to-do list this week? Well, me personally, for like I said, I'm we're still taking this cohort of teachers through most of them, this, and it's adult basic skills educators. So it's people who are working in either community-based organizations all the way through to community colleges where it may be even more structured. So, and it kind of tying back to some of the questions I was asking you, some of them have already set up Google Classroom, so they have some way to connect, but these are adults who come and go easily. You know, persistence is a huge issue. They've probably already failed in formal education once. And so now this is like a huge pause in their opportunity, um, to, whether they're pursuing their high school equivalency or trying to get a job or whatever it might be. So some of the things that are my teachers that are I'm working with are struggling with is, will my students even be there? If I, if I put something out there, um, like last semester, once teachers started out with like nine or 10 students and then their ha campus happened to be hit by a, it was a regular flu bug and they never came back. And so some of those are kind of interesting issues for them to think through. And so I, that's why I'm kind of really intrigued by all of these ideas. And I was asking with John and um, like, how are you connecting with people now that they're not following their traditional coming here, sitting down, teacher's going to be there, as you were saying, the routine of it. How do we try to establish some degree of routine and make it so it's not such a free for all wild, wild west? To get oh, have support like what happened with us is we we're, we're we're functioning in a korean space you know where a lot of stuff is just the menus are in korean so all the foreign faculty at my university started a group chat for the first time which we should have done a long time ago and we have people from 17 different language-based countries i think so it's it was really a great support network so as we're struggling with whatever canvas issue or zoom issue we can kind of support each other which has been a really nice uh, result of all of this. Um, has that kind of stuff happened in your worlds? Mm -hmm. uh, lots, lots of ad hoc. You mean ad hoc like support yeah. for teachers, helping teachers? Definitely. 
we're we're seeing much of that. Um, what we're not seeing yet, or at least that I, I'm not aware of yet, are the people who normally collaborate are not necessarily doing it. We're not getting the team meetings, the PLCs, like the the department meetings, like those kinds of things where they're not. At least I'm not seeing that they're collaborating or being purposeful about it. What we are seeing are the ad hoc pieces, right? The I I need help with this, and I know who can help me, and and so we'll loop in three or four people and and do things that way. Um, I think on my to do list or or one of the priorities now is once last week was about like let's let's dip our toe let's get started um, this week it's it's about all of the exceptions you know what are we doing about students with exceptional needs what are we doing about uh, students without um, without internet access what are, you know how are we handling um, you know IEPs how are we handling um, speech and language services like all of those kinds of things which were you know, you, you sort of write off and say, like, let's for the first few days, let's just get started and, and try to meet the the bulk of our students' needs. And now it's well, we got to meet everybody's needs. And so, how do we bring everybody else up? So that that's one of the challenges this week. I know one of the things that I'm trying to do <clears throat> with all these conversations is trying to ask people to remember how they feel while they're sitting in their house trying to connect to people so that they can put that in a box and pull it back out the next time they're actually teaching people who are in that situation. Because it's the first time for a lot of people that they've actually been, I mean, if you've been a faculty member for 20 years, you've been a teacher. Um, one of the other things I did since we all got together is I did strategy for K-12 and I did a lot of teacher training stuff. Um, but if you've been a teacher for 20 or 30 years and are good at what you do and care about what you do, the biggest thing that 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 I that we all noticed when we worked together was how long it had been since they had been uncomfortable, right? How long it had been since they had been uncertain. So if you've been teaching grade five math for thirty years and you're the expert, it's been a long time since you didn't know what to do, and now everybody's having that experience suddenly, right? Everybody's kind of like, ah, uh, I've got <clears throat> all these kids I care about at home, and I'd like to keep teaching them. But, uh, um, and I'm just trying to get people to go, just feel that feeling, mm -hmm. you know, write about it if you can put it like, write yourself a letter. Like, I don't care how you go about doing it, but just remember the frustration and the confusion and that feeling you had the first time somebody reached out and went, how you doing? Right. Just that whole part of it, right. Pedagogy is a care. You know, and that's what I'm trying to encourage people as much as I can. Because again, I'm in the same position. Suddenly I'm in my basement going, Blackboard? I don't really know. Yeah, right. Right? How about you, Jeff? You sound um, like you're, you're actually leaving the house. So you actually have like... <laughs> And like, you know, my, my wife is actually going to school. The students are supposed to come back uh, April 6th, I think. Um, but the teachers thought to go in occasionally to be public servants um uh you know i'm intrigued well in my inbox and my to-do list is dealing with the uh, effective issues of zooming all day for my teacher trainees and and pulling back on the screen time and just making that a more manageable situation and dealing with their disappointment of like not having the face-to-face -face experience and probably not going to Canada and yeah. uh, and working, doing it all day while their colleagues are at home, <laughs> you know, because school is canceled. Yeah. Wait, I signed up for six months off and I'm here all day. Um, and then dealing just with the logistics of, of um, meeting the bureaucracy, but also like, okay, how am I going to teach this conversation course uh, in a meaningful way? So I, I've survived the first week. I'm getting a handle on Canvas. Now I'm thinking, okay, what are the possibilities? You know, having digital output is, this is very friendly for that. Um, so dealing with that. I'm, you know, really curious about this EBS streaming that starts today where they're, you know, the broadcasting the, and I feel like that's really going to be an accelerant. Like, you know, when I was discussing this with my, my wife, like why should, a hundred seventh grade teachers be teaching the same thing today in Pusan when there's a really great teacher on EBS who's probably going to do it better. And if that's the case, then what are those other 99 people going to do? Oh, but it's not <laughs> interactive, 
right? It's broadcast. So it's one person talking to thousands of people instead of 15 or, or 30. Or and you, I mean, I would think it, if the kid's at a terminal, then they can, it's also interactive in that way. Okay, here, take this quiz. Oh, you know, it could be, yeah. yeah. I mean, if it's done synchronously. Right. right? Yeah, it, it is going to be synchronous. Wow. I mean, they could consume it asynchronously. So, I mean, it's sort of like a little bit of flipped learning in there. And I do think it's going to, you know, I've always, I'm always talking about the changing role of the teacher going forward, you know, forward you know is what? here. It's, I mean, the technology changes, but these are the same conversations they had about <laughs> correspondence courses, you know, when you watched it on your public broadcasting. And I remember my dad took like, like his real estate broker things, he would get like a, a tape that would go in the machine and then he'd watch the lecture. And so every, like you said, everybody watched the same lecture and he had like a, a book, he'd fill out his answers. Well, that's not that much different than watching it on a computer screen and then taking the quiz afterwards. So, you know, these issues- Personally, I think it's gonna be hard for me to go back to face-to-face. -to -face. I do not miss the commute. <laughs> I love- yeah. uh... I, you know, I'm getting used to this. It's going to be weird to like actually stand in front of a class again. Yeah. I was just looking at, um, over at our all. chat. Are you watching the chat? It, John's doing a great job keeping up with Lisa. I didn't hope I was missing it, but Lisa mentioned Second Life. I, I don't, I don't think she was joking. I think she said that there's going to be a conference in Second Life. And uh, I haven't heard anyone moving over okay. there for stuff. I think I still owe Lisa $5 or something. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> is that why you're being nice uh you know i have to be nice to to some people it's just not your turn yet <laughs> so john i need to know what can come true if i have the courage to pursue them because i can't tell i just know it can come true oh that that's a disney quote Let me... i just need the top dreams okay good dreams. i didn't know what was coming true it's been driving me nuts <laughs> something's coming true I can pursue it. Just tell yeah. me what it is. It's here, we've got the whole, well, the whole, you've been in the room. The whole room's Disney stuff. So, so Jeff, let us know, how do we get from where we are now to where you are? Like, what did you guys have to go through? You mentioned before we started, I think it was, you guys were, you were had the masks. You thought that was uh, helpful. Yeah, I think masks are a big deal. Um, I think testing, you know, we had the testing in place, ready to go. And Every time someone in Pusan gets uh, pinged, we get pinged that, okay, this person uh, was at Costco from 9.30 until 11, really? and then they were, and so, okay, I'm going to stay away from there. Wow. So you know what happened with the masks here, eh, Jeff, in North America? There weren't enough masks here, so the, the language went out right away that they didn't actually help. Mm -hmm. um, and so... It's, it's scaled back from there. So then it was, if you're sick, it does help. But if you're not, it doesn't. And then it's scaled back again where they're like, well, it doesn't perfectly help, which was what was true all along. The problem but, was the healthcare professionals couldn't get masks. Because this is right. This is exactly perfect. it. So they had to, they put out that messaging here because there just weren't enough, like on in stock. Really? Even Canada did that? Um, no, I mean, we're so affected by... The, we, we did have the store here, but we we're so affected by the American messaging that the messaging here starts to get impacted immediately as soon as it goes out in the States. We're sorry. Sorry, Dave. <laughs> no, no. And it's, it's been a weird thing, right? So suddenly I live in a border town. The medical situation on my side of the border is different than the medical situation in Michigan. Michigan, in this case, happens to be Detroit, which again, doubly has a problem right in terms of this. So it is, is a weird thing for somebody who thinks of Detroit as one of the great things about the city that they live in, which I do. Um, but suddenly it's like, uh, you know, there's a lot of people here who work in Michigan. Um, and actually our second case in our town was again, somebody who worked in Michigan who went over for something and came back. And it's suddenly we've got this concern, right? Where um, our friends in the, well, actually for us, our friends from the North, because Detroit is technically North of Windsor, um, are suddenly a, a, like not a threat, but like where we've got this problem, right? Cause while our, it was kind of funny that Mexico kind of brought up the idea of closing the border first, <laughs> yeah. maybe we will we'll pay for that wall. <laughs> oh, I'm pretty, yeah, you, you cut us off before we cut you off. I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 we don't mean anything by it. Like it's not, <laughs> Nothing personal, all but right. you know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that, but all it's right. just you know, you guys haven't tested anybody, and <laughs> yeah. you know, you you haven't 
uh, you know, the Michigan, the Michigan state governor just said that they're doing an exception for churches for large gatherings, hmm. even though, in, as Jeff will tell you that the major first major uh, outbreak in Korea was in a church. 60% came from uh, a ch with this one church patient number 31. I'd say 90% of all cases in Korea have come from religious gatherings. It's crazy and that the and, only and other major one is a call center. And in Michigan, this is what they did, right? And we're like, like, just close Why? the door. Like, come on, stop, stop. Like, yeah, see, they're, they're so worried about the First Amendment. that. All right. Yeah, I, I understand it. But in Ohio, we, Jesus makes house, make house calls. Around <laughs> Jesus makes house calls. Already omnipotent and omniscient. <laughs> like, really? Come on. Yeah, I think, John, I think if I saw your wife went to like a parking lot for her service yeah. today, right? Yeah, yeah it said, uh, this, and this church said, we're, Brick, come and stay in your car, crack your window a little bit, and, you know, we'll be up front. And they're, next week, they're going to broadcast, uh, you know, an, on an FM channel so that everybody can just, you know, it's like the drive in, right? It's great. You your radio. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And, uh, you know, sing along or whatever. I, I didn't go. It, it wasn't our church. It was just another uh, church that was nearby that she heard about and said, I want to try this out. So she went. So. See, I, th I mean, there's part of me that's like, you know, oh, woe is us. But then there's like this whole silver lining part of it that it's like all this weird stuff. That, remember, Jeff, you walked around with the old tricorder or whatever people <laughs> <laughs> when you went to podcast or whatever that was. Podcast. Pod camp, yeah. Pod camp, yeah. And now, like, everybody's having to come up with these weird things just to, you know, communicate. Weird it. things. It's click, oh, click, click. I'm, I'm sorry. Not, not weird, Jeff. That wasn't Careful, weird no. at all. Careful. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm saying weird. that was weird. I'm saying it's so not weird now. It's so easy. Like, as soon as things got easy, we stopped right. webcasting. Right. Well, it's easy. But like you said, like, there's still, like, we're, we're, make, we're forcing people over their normal apprehensions, like, yeah. tough. Like, you, if you want to go to church, you're going to turn on your yeah. radio now. You know, it's like, that's how we do it. But but there are no implications, right? There are no expectations. There are no, you, you know, if you screw it up, you screw it up, right? Yeah. There's no, there are no consequences involved. So it's a great time for experimentation. Mm -hmm. And our teachers are starting to see that as like, wait, I can do whatever I want. And you know, we Imagine. cancel testing or we're going to cancel testing. Um, doesn't really matter. We're not going to do grades more than likely for the fourth quarter of the, of the school. So go just play with stuff and, you know, if your if your kids learn something, that's fantastic. If they don't, we'll figure it out next year. Yeah, but you know, oh, to your point though, like or what we've been saying, like they will have learned that this is now a new way to communicate, and it won't be so foreign, and it will be right, new. right. So, and these are early days, and I think this is gonna last a while. Uh, and so, you know, we're still in survival mode for the most part, but I think people are gonna have personal experience with this. They're gonna learn some lessons. So, I think coming semester, I think we're not going to be totally out of the woods. I think there's going to be time to sort of process this and think, okay, well, if I'm going to do this, this is the way I want to do it. I think there's going to be a lot of experimentation yep. and adoption eventually. I, I hope so. I mean, my PhD program just went online for the summer. <gasps> yeah, you got to tell us what's going on. Dr. Dave, what's going on? I, no. I just got snippets on, Make on, look on, bad, Jeff. on the Twitter machine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. Like? So um, I found some people who are dumb enough to take me on uh, as a student, and it's in my school. Oh, how um, awesome. And my boss is in the same program. So he's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Just do whatever. So it's a really nice, comfortable situation for me. And basically, I'm going to be doing not the same thing I'm doing in my day job, because you're not allowed to do that, because heaven forbid you do your PhD, something practical. <laughs> um, but it will definitely be different. Um, but yeah, so um, I'm doing my PhD in pedagogies of abundance, basically. Um, Martin Weller's, um, I'm still convinced 2011 article he wrote when he was drunk. Um, but <clears throat> Which, by the way, I think he just got a case of wine, he said, so maybe he'll be right. Yeah, there yeah, no, well, so, that's yeah. it. That's this is what I'm saying. There's lots of proof. I can prove <laughs> yeah. it. I'm telling you. Can you give me a three sentence answer, answer to what is pedagogies of abundance? Um, you know me better than that, Jeff. Um, <laughs> so, yes, I can. Um, pedagogy of abundance are the ways in which we deal with teaching and learning whenever information is moved from being scarce and hard to find to move to being more than you can possibly manage and, and, and adjust to. And just that change in how we need to look at the learning process, given that. Ooh, nicely done. <gasps> Complex sentence structure. So but many tight. ways you could take that. I mean, you could go. practice in that for four and a half years. 
That's <laughs> excellent. I love so it. The, the actual PhD application was for mid-career teachers and how they adjust. Um, Cause I think they're the sweet spot in, in the structure. Cause most of the training ends up being for the people who don't know how to use the technology or the new people who have the whatever. But I think it's that core in that 10 to 20 year range who are still driven, but are the ones who really guide the whole system. So pre-burnout, but post pre burnout Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. I think that in, in my experience in any of the systems I've ever worked in, they're the ones who are hardest to convince because they know what they're trying to get done. And if you can't convince them, then the system doesn't change. Uh, Lisa's giving us some crap, I believe. She's saying that sounds like a dissertation, not a major. <laughs> Dr. Durf, <laughs> dishing it out. <laughs> no, I, I love it. I, I cannot wait to follow that trajectory of your... Can you oh, read his papers and summarize them for me, please? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm really, I am an excellent, I, I was an editor for a journal for like many, many years. I love, and I just tear papers apart. So if you'd like so, any help on that. So you know, I just sent in the the draft of my book to the publisher, right? Oh, Jesus, no. On I the same topic. No. Yeah. You wrote a book before you have the degree? <laughs> oh, What's the title I of the book? <laughs> uh, probably something along the same lines. Um, there's a bunch of things in there. Community as curriculum has been floated as a title. Um, but the problem is, is I've got, I've got, I don't know, there's probably 62. John uh, is very familiar with his work. Um, he's been editing his way through it. Um, John and a couple of other, other of uh, our friends. And I sent it in uh, on Wednesday unexpectedly because I contacted the publisher and I'm like, uh, the world of education just changed <laughs> and I'm, I'm starting to think that while i think this book is really applicable to now i'm almost thinking that i should rewrite it <laughs> because in yeah, like on the first of march it may have made sense and john may tell you it doesn't but it may have made sense on the trajectory it was on but it's close enough to what we're talking about now that i could tweak it and have it be really applicable to this and i'm like does that even make sense was the plan for this to be an actual paper book? Yeah. Wow. They still make yeah. those, I guess. They do. They do. It's amazing how, yeah, it, there's a lot of reasons. I just got to the point where I realized that the only thing that was going to allow me to get more access to the debate for the change I was trying to make was to actually have something printed on paper. Good wow. question from Durf. Uh, are rhizomes in the book? Are rhizomes in the book? They yes. are, um, peripherally. Uh, I don't know that John has actually run across the word yet. Would you have by chapter six, John? Yeah. No. Find it, did you find it? You haven't gotten there Control yet. F. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if he control F it, it's in there later. Um, but no, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it's my attempt to write a book that somebody might actually be willing to read. Um, so no, it doesn't delve into strange French postmodern philosophy or anything. It's just and there are no multiple choice questions at the end. Well, there could be at the oh. end of every at the end of every section. Yes, in every section. That's right. What if you did like an audio book and then when you got to a section you'd want to change, you just riff and you just go. You know what? I said that <laughs> that was before the pandemic, and now I would like. This yeah, is that was like was, two weeks ago. I'm like, this is, obviously, that was amazing. This is what I would like to say now. <laughs> anyway, it'll be a good book. Oh, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm it's not ready for paper yet, in my opinion, but it, it's going to be a good book. <laughs> not ready for paper yet, he says. Oh. oh. Uh, so for old time's sake, anybody got any new fun tools or resources? Links Ooh. of the week? I did put some links in a, in a thing. Let's, in a delicious account. Account. Nice Let's check the delicious. I know. Delicious is dead, right? Broke our hearts. Yeah. All right. I'm putting it in our little chat roll. Is that right? I just have to do it. I just have to do it. Okay, here you go. There's my uh, Jane Hart stuff. Good old Jane Hart. <laughs> Believe it or not, I still share this with people when they're freaking out going, I don't know. So that, that was more of a joke. But to Jeff, I think to your, to help you potentially, have you read this? Um, this it's kind of been floating around. This guy's blog post <clears throat> about video conferencing alternatives. 
and like um, recognizing the reality that some of our students don't have internet at home. So they got, they're dealing with low broadband. Um, and then the whole idea of making, forcing people to have a synchronous exchange when that may be really difficult if you don't have childcare and all these other issues that may creep in. Um, and he just comes up with some really good alternatives and kind of lays it out in this little matrix. We all love matrix, you know, like with boxes and quadrants and things. And I just thought it was a really practical approach that he took to say, guys, just, you know, chillax. You don't have to go right to Zoom and 25 minute recorded lectures. There's like other things we could be doing that are lower bandwidth, lower requirements on the students. So that's my pitch for the week. Well, I'll, I'll piggyback on that and say that, um, you know, one of the things we've been pointing people to is everyone on, which is an, an organization that really helps bridge digital divide stuff. And, and when, um, when you're telling all of your kids, you need to be learning online and they are, they don't have online at their house, um, that can be quite a challenge. And so a, a lot of the ISPs are providing deals, especially in the U S that's where my context is right now for, um, you know, for the coronavirus um, response and for people trying to do school at home. And, and so there are a lot of um, service providers that are providing either really attractive deals or free deals for uh, this spring. So, just to try to help people get online just to get school done and get work done and whatever they can do. So there is that link. Very good. Come on, Dave. I don't have a link particularly. The thing that, that comes to mind that, that I would drop is maybe the most important lesson that I learned last year in this whole process, which was that the introverts need to participate too. And it, I don't think anybody's ever heard me talk has confused me with an introvert before. Um, but one of the things about live sessions is they can be really trying and exhausting for those introverts. And when you look at the work, I'll throw in a work about uh, a link about pedagogies of care, but, um, when you think about the scope of the different ways that people interact, having that time to sit back and think and consider is something that can be really, really valuable for some people, not just for their ability to participate, but just for the cognitive load that they're taking on. So for many of us who are teachers, we end up being extroverts. We're the people who like being in front of the room. We're the people who like to talk. We think active engagement and, and sort of loud engagement is something that's a positive. And for a lot of people, it's not. So when you're going through this process, try to imagine its impact on everybody else. And I think that the work that's been done in Pedagogies of Care does a really good job of, uh, of working through that. So I'll get that link and pop that in. Jeff? I, I got nothing useful. I mean, <laughs> I, I know my fault. I, I just, I needed some help. I, uh, uh, I love the video of the Israeli woman freaking out about uh, being angry about, uh, she has four kids and she's like, why are you sending all this work? I don't know algebra. And I'll post a link to that. Um, and kudos to the teacher who wrote the uh, uh, We Will Survive song about using Zoom and Canvas. Oh yeah. Great, yeah. Um, I am going to put one more in. I'm sorry. I've got, I've got a couple, but this one I want. Jen. I haven't had a chance to think about this or really spend You've had five and a half it. years, so you should have a few. <laughs> <in the laughs> I do. I've got a couple links I'd like to share. But if you guys followed this one, the Teach From Home from Google. And again, it's so hard with Google. It's like, are you, so, you know, you're trying to get us on your stuff. We get it, what you're trying to do here. But I mean, I think there are some, <laughs> some helpful things that they're doing here. But I think if there's also a broader uh, commentary here is, We've done this before. I think we might be doing it again. We're letting the tech people drive the conversation. And so it is something I want to point to because I think there's, it's kind of interesting. They're very good at, obviously Google's pretty good at sharing um, or at getting people to use the internet effectively. But it also always makes me a little nervous when the tech companies are driving the, the narrative in education. So well, you have to be careful, right? I mean, one of the things that, that has come up a lot for in my world is every company in the world is giving away their product for free right now. You know, and so it's, hey, sign up for this, or, or you know, you've got even even Zoom, right? You can you can go beyond the forty minute limit, um, and every tool that we have is like that. All the premium stuff is free now, and then what do you do in two months when all of those offers expire and you have built this as part of uh, an ecosystem that you're dependent on? And so we've been really careful about what are we adopting, what are we adding, even though it's free. Uh, is this something that we can sustain over the long term? And is it something that, that is worth that? And so privacy. being careful about that. Yeah, that. right. You gotta, you, you still have to do all of that due diligence. We're still reading the terms of service and dealing with privacy yeah. and dealing with all of that stuff. 
and then also trying to not fragment the staff too much, right? Because everybody, back to the abundance thing, right? Everybody's looking at Google and saying, um, not looking at Google as a search and saying, how do I do this stuff? And they're hearing from other educators, other schools, other, you know, other entities and, and saying, I'm just figuring it out as, as I go along. And that means that they're building their own toolkits. And so we don't have a lot of standardization and, we, and we're trying to be careful about that. So, you know, we don't want them in four different video platforms so that when we come back, we're trying to support all of this different stuff. So we're really careful when we push things out to our teachers, like, okay, which screencasting tool are we going to tell them to use? Which, um, you know, video conferencing solution are we gonna say, this is the best way to go for you? And so we're really trying to filter that stuff for them to keep them from adopting everything. So that's been a challenge for us. I threw a couple things in the uh, chat. One was um, the website that we kind of put together internally for our schools. Um, and mostly it's, it's how do I do this stuff? How do I teach this stuff online? And, and there's a lot of video tu tutorials in there and um, descriptions and like, okay, a as a teacher, this is why you would use this tool. This is, or this is the problem that you have and this is how we would solve it. Um, and these are the resources that you need to do it. And so there, there's a lot of that stuff in there. And th this guy um, keeps doing these videos every day. I don't know if you know anything about mm -hmm. that, but he's fantastic. And I, I it just, it leaves a bad taste in my mouth to say these things, but <laughs> I eat them every day because it's like this guy's right and he's um, um, uncharacteristically concise and like he's on. Uncharacteristically <laughs> concise. He's, just, he's really good. These backhanded compliments, they just come one right after yeah. the other. They do. I feel very. I deserve all of them. Like it's all good. Today, Not the compliment but, part, but the backhand. But, Dave's hitting it out of the park. If you haven't watched his videos I have not. every day I, on I how do I approach teaching online, they're just really good. So what are you doing? You're zooming it and then you're putting them out on uh, like streaming it on YouTube? Or no, what you it's doing? actually funny because one of the things that and now that I'm like, oh, I have all kinds of links to post. Um, I spend a bunch of times playing with a bunch of different technologies to do that thing that I really love to do, which is turn the camera on, look into the camera and try my best to get five minutes of thinking out. Um, thing I like about that is that it's, I'm lazy and, you know, you hit start, you hit stop and it's done. So I tried OBS studio, which is very good. Um, but it's in a couple of extra clicks, but the inside the new YouTube creator studio, you can set up a timed start and it doesn't actually time a start. Like the timing's not actually all that useful, except that somebody can open up the window and it will hold them there until you actually start, which is really all mm. it does. But when you hit go live, it gives you like a four second pause and then you can go straight in. The audio quality is good. The video quality is fine. Uh, it does a good job of adapting to light. And then, um, so yeah, I've just been going straight into YouTube, which has been really, really good. Oh, cool. Yeah, no, and I think for a lot of people, then one of the things I've been encouraging people to do is don't do two hour videos, but rather do five minute videos about one thing that you really care about and then like, drive forward with that and put that as a discussion starter right mm -hmm. rather than a two-hour lecture which uh, no offense jeff but oh my god two hour like, yes. yeah. like no. don't worry i'm not giving two-hour yeah. lectures two hours <laughs> i am not a lecturer in five and a half six hours i'm an asker of questions <laughs> yeah no so it's really tough um for for a lot of people out there trying to figure out how to make this conversion but i think the youtube straight to live is is a really nice option uh the only thing that you have to hit the left button there's a menu on the top of the screen it took me like three days to find it um because uh, i'm dumb apparently but yeah you just hit the the go straight and it goes yeah. google always find always hides the important button there's always like a continue or a something that yeah oh. yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but those have been really good um, they've been fun to do. I started them because I was getting twitchy, right? Because we like we could all see it coming. Our university was waiting until it got a chance to change its Senate regulations, giving people the freedom to make choice. And I understood why they did that. But I was like, we need to get started. This is going to get crazy really soon. Mm -hmm. um, so I just started doing videos and then put it up on a website. And Bonnie convinced me to make it look prettier. Uh, I should say what it is. Olaya.ca, O-L-I-A-H.ca. You putting that in, John? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Just like uh, I want it. <laughs> um, we should also mention uh, Durf and Jose have put in a bunch of uh, useful yeah. links into the chat, yeah. which we will certainly put in the show notes. 
thank you so much for coming out and listening to us just rambling. <laughs> I'm just saying, Durf, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be an EdTech talk if you weren't trash talking me. I really appreciate right. it. <laughs> you gotta go back and read it. It's been, yeah, she's yeah, Durf, she has not lost a step. <laughs> she has not lost a step. <laughs> it's great. Uh, this, this was so fun, Jeff. Thank you for making us do it. Making us Yeah. Do it. Don't know why we waited so long. So well, we didn't now. not we didn't have any excuse. Like literally have no <laughs> excuse. <laughs> and that going to get my hair cut and nothing <laughs> well i have six yeah, hours of teaching ahead today well you go you the best of luck with that you do your best jeff you do your best it's all we can do it's all you can do are we doing this again i'd be up for it 2025 yeah next <laughs> pandemic i'm there can we get a, can we get a picture behind you though jeff like i feel like i need a picture well, sure you can do a thingy like I can, that. Yeah, that too. I'll do my virtual yeah. background. Do a virtual background. Yeah. Or closet doors or something. <laughs> it does sort of look like you're, yeah. Like Yay. 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 That's nice. Chilling. Stay chill, people. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> All right. Well, everyone stay safe. Yeah. Jeff, you're the only yep. one who actually has a mask. The rest Wash of us. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Yeah, don't touch your face. I know that. Um, and we'll be back sometime. Sometime. Hey, Sometime. how's how's Tuesday nights for you guys? We're not allowed to leave Seriously, the house. Jeff. Okay. <laughs> every, yeah, nothing. Every night is great. <laughs> every night. <laughs> Does have its advantages. <laughs> my my only caveat will be I may not make some of those because I have um, an eleven and thirteen year old in my house, and they need a lot of yeah, attention, <clears throat> and I'm working. I, who are entertaining too? We should actually bring them on. Yeah, I was going to say yeah. they are very much invited. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually. They're 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 I Gen, Gen Z. They are Gen Z. Yeah, no, and they're um, they're performers, so they're more than happy to get in front of the microphone. <laughs> well, Dave, we should do that. That. Dave, we should just do that with your kids and my kids, right? Yeah. Hey, do you have enough yeah. devices in your home? There are four Macs in my house. Plus, I brought my work computer home, which you can see in the background there. Plus, we have you know some other devices lying around. Oh my God, Oscar broke his uh, his cell phone yesterday. No, that yeah, 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 yeah. Dropped on the floor and cracked, and he's like broke, like won't touch screen, won't work, nothing. And he's like, uh, this is a kid who never asks for anything. Like he's not a, um, but he's like, um, I'm locked in the house for the next six months. Um, <laughs> I know I dropped the phone, and I know I took off the protective case that you told me I should have on it, but. Uh, do you think maybe <laughs> <laughs> um, gravity is a heartbreaker? Yeah, yeah, I know it is. We we get our phones from Swapa, Swapa.com, which is they're they're pre-owned phones, but they're um, they're clean phones. And in, in other words, they guarantee that they're not stolen phones and they're not black. You know, they they actually work. Um, I don't know if that's those are options for you. But um, anyone with teenagers should be aware of that site. Yeah, tough, we, tough for we, me to get across uh, the border right now. And and it's good too because we we typically buy like a generation old or two generation old phones so that we're not paying eight hundred dollars for them and uh, yeah we we go through phones quite a bit. All right, all right. Up, Jeffy. Well, on that note, it has been great talking to everybody. Everybody, everybody out there, stay safe. Thanks for tuning yeah, in live or to the recording. We'll, we'll look know. forward to the, continuing the conversation sometime. Next time. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys later. Yeah. Have a good yeah. night or yeah. day. Have a good morning, Jeff. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, guys. Bye.